Hi, I'm Brian E. Denton, author of the book Year of War and Peace and the Poetry Collection Inspiration. Welcome to my channel. This video is part of a series I'm doing on Dante's Divine Comedy, wherein I'm reading through the entire epic poem at a rate of three cantos or chapters per week. And I'm doing this as kind of an independent contribution to Baylor University's 100 Days of Dante project. The 100 Days of Dante project, if you haven't heard of it, is a lot like mine. They're also reading through the entire Divine Comedy at a rate of three cantos per week. And um, they're posting videos on YouTube and they have their own webpage, which is linked to down in the show notes below. You should definitely check that out. They're really high quality, good scholars and very interesting things to learn about. Uh, it's a lot better than my stuff, quite frankly. But um, if this is your first time visiting, I say welcome. And I would also ask that you please consider liking this video and subscribing to the channel. We've set uh, the goal of getting to 200 subscribers by the end of October, and we're at 157, I think, at the time of this recording. So it's totally doable. I think we can get there, especially with your help. So I thank you in advance for that. A quick note about the organization of these videos. There's an introduction, which is what I'm doing right now. And the introduction will be followed by a synopsis, where I'll just review very quickly the basic plot and action found in each canto. After that, there'll be a section dedicated to characters and themes. It's self-evident what, what that's about. And then uh, after that, there's the takeaway section where I will offer my own personal views on the canto. And I'll try to look at how we can use that canto to improve our own lives. Finally, I'll conclude and then we'll just go wherever the YouTube algorithm takes us. All right, so let's get right into it then. Dante's Inferno, Canto 12. We open with our two heroes descending down the treacherous steep that they met at the end of the last canto. At this chasm's jagged edge, they meet the Minotaur of Crete, a raving beast who gnaws at his own body in a fit of rage. It's a threat, and the last thing you want to do is be murdered by a raging Minotaur of Crete. So Virgil taunts this guy. The taunting works. The Minotaur loses itself in an absolute rage, and our two heroes slip by while it's lost in this mental storm of fury. As they continue down the steep, Virgil explains that there was once a landslide here, and he points to the physical manifestation of this landslide, and he offers his explanation for why this happened. And then they continue on. Shortly after this talk, Virgil directs Dante's focus to an upcoming river. And this river, Virgil says, is full of boiling blood, which scalds those who, during their earthly life, committed the sin of violence. Dante the poet then offers his third apostrophe in this poem, and he uses this time to warn readers about the ravages of covetousness and how covetousness is what leads to such misery. At this point, a bunch of centaurs show up, and they're armed with bows and arrows, and they're ready to shoot. They demand to know what's going on. Who are these two people, and what are they doing here? Virgil announces that he'll only talk to Chiron, and then he tells Dante who these centaurs are. Chiron, among the group, he notices that Dante's body is the only body that seems to dislodge any of the trail as he walks upon it, and so therefore he must be alive. And Virgil indeed confirms that Dante is alive, and that his task is to guide this man, Dante, the live man, through this infernal valley. Virgil also asks for a ride across the river, because a living man can't very well swim across a river of boiling blood. And the centaur is obliged. And so, Dante the poet mounts on top of one of them, and they start to ford across that river. Now as they ford this river, they start to see those who are punished here. And the people are punished in this canto by being submerged in this river of boiling blood. Some of them are submerged up to their brows. Some of them are submerged up to their throats. Some of them are submerged up to their waists. And still others are submerged only up to their feet. And then, with the two heroes deposited safely on the other side of the river, the centaurs return to where they came from, and we wait with our two heroes for the next canto. There's plenty to talk to in terms of themes and character in this canto. So much so, in fact, that it's a little bit difficult to whittle it down to just a few topics, but that's what I had to do, and I picked four of them. And the four topics that I'd like to cover in terms of character and themes are these. I want to talk about the Minotaur. I want to talk about the souls being punished down here in the river of boiling blood. I want to talk about the Canto's apostrophe. And then I want to talk about how Virgil's explanation of the landslide can actually help contemporary readers think about the dangers of fake news media. I know, just wait till I get there. Let's start with a Minotaur. And here we'll discuss what a Minotaur is, 
what role the Minotaur serves in this canto, and then also how the Minotaur is actually the perfect personification of the theme of this canto. So first of all, what is a Minotaur? Well, a Minotaur is yet another example of Greek mythology in this poem. It's half man and it's half bull creature. It's actually a very interesting story how the Minotaur came to be according to Greek mythology. So you have the Queen of Crete, and she, as one does, falls in love with a bull. And so she asks Daedalus to provide her with a wooden cow that she can hide away in, and then lure the bull to her so the two of them can listen to Luther Vandross LPs together. So the spawn of that awful coupling now serves as an infernal guardian in Dante's Inferno. And that is his purpose. He serves as a guardian of this particular region of hell. And that's where we meet him today. As guard, he's the first to confront these two people, Dante the Pilgrim and Virgil the Guide. And it turns out he doesn't do too good of a job at keeping the intruders out. Before moving on to our talk about the sinners who are punished in this canto, it should be first noted how perfect of a symbol the Minotaur is to use here. And the reason I say that is because the sin being punished in this canto is the sin of violence. And for Dante, the sin of violence is undergirded by the vice of anger. That is, it is the vice of anger which gives rise to acts of violence. And, as we saw before, this Minotaur is very angry. And not only that, but throughout the classical literature, as we'll see later in the takeaway section with Seneca, and also in Dante himself, he refers to anger as a bestial emotion, a beastly emotion. This is an animalistic thing. It's not, it's not really a human, it's, I mean, it's a human emotion, but it brings out the beast in man. And so the Minotaur is perfect in that respect because it's half beast and half man. Now let's move on to the sin and the sinners being punished in this canto. And as we said before, the sin being punished is the sin of violence. Now this may be confusing to some readers because haven't we already, up in the fifth circle of hell, punished wrath? And indeed we have. And wrath is a form of violence, or at least it is according to common language as we employ it today. But one must remember the distinctions that Dante makes between sins of incontinence on the one hand and sins of willfulness on the other. Now, the sin of wrath up in the fifth circle of hell was a sin of incontinence, and we covered this in our video on the same. Whereas now, we're in the city of Dis, so we're dealing with sins of willfulness. All right, so just keep that in mind as we move forward. And one more quick thing to note about this is it's interesting that Dante chooses to punish both of these sinners by means of a river. Up in the fifth circle of hell, you remember that they were, they were, the sinners were being punished by being just submerged under the water, and we had this great bubbling up of their screams. And here, they're also submerged in a river, only this river is much, much worse. This river is a, a river of boiling blood. And also, just as we saw in the previous canto when Virgil gave his lecture about the organization of hell, you'll recall that the sins being punished in this canto are going to be sins against one's neighbor. Because recall, this circle of hell consists of three rings. The first ring, where we are now, is uh, violence against one's neighbor. That's what's being punished here. And then in the next ring, it's going to be violence against oneself. And in the ring below that, it will be violence against God. Moving on. As we read, the sins in this canto are being punished by means of sinners being submerged into a river of boiling blood. Do you see the contrapasso here? Well, it's this. In their earthly life, these sinners allowed their boiling blood to inflict harm upon others. Whereas now, for all eternity, they're going to be punished themselves by their own boiling blood. And there even appears to be a hierarchy found within this river. You'll remember that some of the sinners are submerged up to their brows, some are submerged up to their throats, some are submerged up to their waists, and still others are submerged only to their feet. So what I think Dante is getting at here is that there's even differences in degrees between the sins against one's neighbor. Now the centaur, as he's fording Dante across the river, he, he talks only about two sets of sinners here. And he says that those that are submerged up to their brows are the tyrants, and those that are submerged in the river of boiling blood up to their throats are murderers. And I can't really figure out what are the other specific sins associated with um, those who are submerged up to their waist and those who are submerged up to their feet. So if you have any ideas, let me know down in the comments below. I'd be really happy to discuss that. Now, it's clear from this canto that Dante the poet actually believes that tyrants are the most blameworthy because it's them who are submerged in this river uh, the most. Remember, they're up to their brows. So not only are they boiling in blood forever, but they're constantly drowning. That's awful. Given this talk of tyrants in the canto, 
it's important to talk a little bit about Dante the political philosopher. So yes, in addition to being a great poet, Dante Alighieri was actually a little bit of a medieval political philosopher. In fact, he wrote this tract called De Monarchia. And in this, in this tract, De Monarchia, he wrote a little bit about tyrants. And what he wrote there informs his thinking in this canto, actually. Dante writes that tyrants are those who never apply public laws for the general welfare, but endeavor to turn them to individual profit. So we see that even in his political work, Dante believes that tyrants are doing violence to one's neighbors, to others. It's very interesting, actually, to compare these two texts, Inferno and De Monarchia, because you'll recall from this canto that Alexander the Great makes an appearance in line 107, and he also appears in De Monarchia. And in De Monarchia, Dante says that he's really a rather poor tyrant. So Dante isn't as harsh on Alexander the Great and De Monarchia as he is in the Inferno. He just says that Alexander doesn't rise to the level of a true monarch. And this brings us back to a discussion we were having in the last video, where we asked whether or not Dante can be considered a medieval proto-liberal based on his support for private property rights and his cosmopolitanism and his multiculturalism. Well, reading De Monarchia, please excuse my pronunciation, it's poor across all languages, including my own native English. But anyway... The thesis of De Monarchia is that Dante believes that in order to achieve perpetual peace, that the world must be ruled by a single monarch ruling over a universal empire. That's simply not liberalism. He does kind of get into some separation of powers issues. He says that temporal power should be ruled over by this monarch, and, and, and spiritual life should be ruled over by the Pope, essentially. But even then... Really not too much of a liberal. Anyway, it's a book worth reading if you have the time. I had the opportunity to skim over it in preparation for this video, and you can see a lot of contemporary Catholic integralist thought in here. I'm sure those guys love it. I don't, even though I was intrigued by it. I'm, I'm really more of a political liberal, I suppose. But anyway, you can pair that with Filmer's Patriarchia for your daily dose of trad right political thought. So now I'd like to talk for a bit about this canto's apostrophe. And this is the third apostrophe in the poem, and it appears in the lines 49 through 51. And that apostrophe goes like this. O blind covetousness, insensate wrath, which in this brief life goads us on, and then, in the eternal, steeps us in such misery. This is an important part of the canto because it speaks directly to what the poet is trying to tell us about the sins of violence. What he means, and we'll get into this more in the takeaway section, is that the sins of violence just don't pop up out of nowhere. They're born from vice. And the vice of greed, and cupidity in particular, it was these sinners' desire for more, their greed, that led them to acts of violence against their neighbor. Finally, I'd like to conclude this section by talking about Virgil's understanding of what happened to the falling rocks, the landslide, found in this canto in lines 32 through 45. And here's what Virgil says. When the deep and foul abyss shook on every side, so that I thought the universe felt love, by which, as some believe, the world has many times been turned to chaos. And at that moment, this ancient rock, here and elsewhere, fell broken into pieces. Now, as Dante the poet clearly wants us to understand, is that the real story of how this rock fell, how this landslide started, is that it became dislodged during Christ's harrowing of hell. Yet Virgil's understanding is completely different, completely severed from reality, if we accept the, this poem's reality as reality. And his knowledge is limited because of his pagan beliefs. Virgil believes in the metaphysics of the ancient Greek philosopher Empedocles. And Empedocles held that the world is governed by alternating ages of love and hatred, concord and chaos. So that's what Virgil's talking about up there, right, in lines 32 through 45. So Virgil, he, he cannot even conceive of the Christian truth. So reading the poem this time in preparation for this video, I was really struck by how apropos these stanzas are in relation to the contemporary problem of fake news and digital misinformation. We have now, just like Virgil here, a lot of people who are unable to see objective reality because they're essentially blinded by epistemic closure and excessive or exclusive reliance on misinformative media sources. And if you think I'm talking about just the other side, no, I'm talking about you. I'm talking about us. So don't be like Virgil as he discusses the landslide. Rather, make a good faith effort to seek out the truth.
Boiling forever in a river of scalding blood does not sound too appealing. So it might be something we'd like to avoid. It might be wise to consider ways to curb the likelihood that we'd ever engage in such terrible acts of violence that would lead us to this punishment. According to Dante, and I think he's correct here, all sins are predicated or built upon the foundation of vice. Vice begets sin. So if we can tame the vice that breeds violence, then we can avoid violence altogether. And that brings us to our takeaway of this canto, which is this. Violence the sin is born in the fiery womb of anger. So anger must be extinguished completely if we're not to fall into the sin of violence. Once again, as we did back in Canto 7, I'd like to turn to our old friend of Limbo, Seneca, and his book, De Ira. I'd like to turn to this book again because, as I said before in Canto 7, it's really, in my opinion, the greatest treatise ever written on the subject of anger and how to eradicate it or at least contain it. So what does Seneca say? Well, one of the first steps in attacking anger, according to Seneca, is to understand where anger comes from, how it launches its assault. And Seneca believes that anger typically starts with an individual who believes that she has been injured. This belief, Seneca calls an impression. Here's what he says. The cause of anger is an impression of injury, and to this we should not easily give credence. We ought not to be led to it quickly, even by open and evident acts. For some things are false that have the appearance of truth. We should allow time. A day discloses the truth. So we see here that anger is born of an impression of injury, and Seneca counsels that the best way to avoid getting angry is actually to interrogate this impression relentlessly. As he says, don't give it easy credence. Take your time in analyzing it and try to find if there's even something to be upset about. Don't give in to your initial reactions, which may be leading you astray. To do this, he says to wait a little bit. Well, what should we do during this waiting period? Seneca has many ideas on what to do during this waiting period, and I'll share just two of them today. The first, he suggests that we adopt some version of Hanlon's razor, which is an old adage that stands for the proposition that one should never attribute to malice what can easily be contributed to stupidity. So be more liberal, more beneficent in our dealings with other people. Seneca writes, There is need of frankness and generosity in interpreting things. We should believe only what is thrust under our eyes and becomes unmistakable. And every time our suspicion proves to be groundless, we should chide our credulity. For this self-reproof will develop the habit of being slow to believe. Further, Seneca would have us just simply expect bad behavior from people. Because bad behavior is just human nature. Think of everything. Expect everything. Even in good character, some unevenness will appear. Human nature begets hearts that are deceitful, that are ungrateful, that are covetous, that are undutiful. When you are about to pass judgment on a single man's character, reflect upon the general mass. Pretty much what he's saying here is that if we expect the offense, then the offense will be less egregious to us. And this is something that I've always loved about the Stoics. I've always called them the happy pessimists because they use their pessimistic view of human nature in order to gain men their own mental tranquility. Well, at any rate, I hope that these simple tools from Seneca will help you in your own battle against anger, because as Dante reminds us in this canto, the vice of anger leads to the sin of violence. And nobody wants to be submerged forever in a river of boiling blood, either up to their feet, their waist, their throat, or their brow. It's just not good. All right, that concludes my video to Canto 12 of Dante's Inferno. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did like it, please consider subscribing to the channel and also liking this video. Remember that I'm setting the goal of getting to 200 subscribers by the end of October. I think it's totally doable. We're already at 157 at the time of recording. So with your help, I think that we can get there. Thanks a lot in advance for that. But um, more importantly than liking the video or subscribing to the channel is getting a conversation started on this poem in this project. So down in the comments below, let me know what you think about the poem in general and this canto in particular. And any of the questions I asked during this video, feel free to answer those and also offer your own thoughts on, on anything. I'm very interested to hear what's going on with you and what you think about the poem. Other than that, if you want to contact me, you can do so on Twitter at Brian E. Denton. And with that, we are going to be releasing these videos every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. This video, of course, is released on a Monday, so the next one will be released on a Wednesday. Until then, take care of yourselves and others.